Dr. Crosby, and I want to kick today off by introducing you to someone uh, special in my life. This is my, my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather and I share a lot of things. We share a name. We share an affinity for Russian literature, um, and we, we share a love of entrepreneurship. Uh, but the connection doesn't stop there, uh, because I was actually born on the two-year anniversary of my grandfather's death. So while I never got to meet my grandfather, he's had a huge impact on my life. He was a successful business owner, a great man and a great father, but his life was cut short right around his 43rd birthday. Um, the, the knowledge of that and growing up with hearing stories about him has led me to a sort of obsession with coming up with rules for successful living, um, coming up with how do you craft a good life because nothing's guaranteed. We don't all get those the 80 years that I think we all think we will, will get. So today we're going to talk about some of these rules that I've found and that, that you'll see in the literature, rules for living a fantastic life. Um, but it's going to be more of a punch in, a, in the face than a pat on the back. So if, if the title didn't tip you off to that. So I want to talk about seven hard truths today. Um, seven hard truths about humanity that I think stand in the way of us being the people we could be um, and living the kind of lives that we ought to live. So the first hard truth that I'm going to face you with is that you're not special. Okay? Bunch of TEDx attendees, you probably think you're something else, right? Smart people that come out to these things, well, I'm not fooled, you're not special. Um, in America, we have an obsession with uniqueness, with specialness, and with giftedness. But it turns out that this obsession and this fasc fascination uh, with specialness has a, really, uh, has a real dark side too. Because once someone thinks of themselves as innately brilliant or innately special, they begin to see themselves as sort of removed from the rest of us. And this is problematic for a couple of reasons. One, it leads to entitlement. Um, a lot of a lot of the friction we see in the workforce today is a generation that was raised being told they were very special, uh, w bumping up against generations that were not told something similar. The other thing that it does that I think is even a little worse is that once someone has been crowned as special, they're really reticent to engage with life because we all get that life is messy and we all get that if we do engage with life we're gonna screw up sometimes we're gonna fall short and we're not always gonna get there so a lot of times the research shows us that kids and people adults even that are told that they're special told that they're gifted and told that they're unique fail to try they don't even put that foot forward because they don't want to risk the messiness of life, messing something up for fear of losing that, that special moniker. So the, the most groundbreaking, uh, oft-quoted study on specialness and giftedness was a study performed by a Stanford psychologist named Lewis Terman. Lewis Terman assembled the greatest bunch of little nerds ever known uh, with an average IQ of 151, right? So the average IQ is 100 and a standard deviation is 15 points. So at 151, you're like three and a half standard deviations above the mean. These kids were brilliant. And what he did was he performed a longitudinal study, which means he followed them over the course of their life. And he called this Terman's termites. I don't know, right? Terman's termites, how to bring them back down to earth. So um, over the years, the termite study is still going on, actually. There's still people alive, even though uh, Dr. Terman himself is not. There are still people taking part in this study. But the, the findings from the Terman's termite study have been notable um, for not being all that notable. You get a bunch of kids with a 151 IQ and you follow them across the lifespan and what you see is, yeah, like, you know, for the most part, they're successful. Um, they publish scholarly papers, they go to grad school, um, but none of them really rocked the world the way that Dr. Sherman thought he would. However, one person involved with the study did rock the world. Um, and his name is William Shockley, and probably many of you have never heard of him, because William Shockley was not included in this Terman's termite study because his, his IQ was not high enough. Well, William Shockley won the Nobel Prize and was voted one of the 100 most influential thinkers of the 20th century by Time magazine. Okay? 
it just goes to show he's living proof that it's not all about specialness, that it's about being special and that unique combination of hard work and grit and determination. William Shockley's story, though, has an unfortunate uh, asterisk, and it is that having been hit by the stick of not special enough himself at a young age, he later hit others with that stick and became a proponent of what's called eugenics. Uh, William Shockley actually vocally advocated that people with an IQ less than 100 be sterilized and not be able to have offspring. So we see specialness is um, an American fascination, but it's not one without a dark side. So it's my proposal to you that we stop worrying about what gifts we came with um, and whether or not we're special and worry a little bit more about what we're doing with those gifts. The second point I want to make is that you're all kind of crazy, okay? I want you to think for a minute about your crazy aunt or your crazy uncle, right? The one that shows up at Thanksgiving with the weird hat or the one that always tells the weird off-color jokes or whatever that is, right? I want you to think about that person and visualize them. Now, I want you to realize that if we did this exercise with a broad enough sample of you, me, and everyone, that you would be somebody's weird aunt, okay? <laughs> right, let that sink in. You are somebody's weird aunt or uncle, or you are someone's weird coworker, or you're someone's head scratcher of why do they do that, right? We're all a little bit crazy. Um, officially, half of us are crazy, uh, even though I'll say that, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, say that we're all a little bit crazy. The National Institute of Ment Mental Health says that the lifetime prevalence of diagnosable mental illness is 46.4%. But this is just the stuff that gets labeled, diagnosed, and uh, a prescription written for. This is not sort of the everyday crazy that you and I are. Okay? But it turns out that being crazy like you and I are isn't all bad because crazy has a lot of upside, okay? Here are some of the upsides to crazy. Crazy people make better leaders in times of crisis because when your whole life is about inner turmoil and struggling to get through the day, it's no big deal when it hits the fan, right? <laughs> right? Crazy leaders, crazy leaders are more empathetic. Depressed people are more empathetic. They've walked through that dark place and they've made it out the other side and they have a lot of reverence and empathy for people who are going through something similar. And finally, manic people, folks with mania, um, are more creative and they don't sleep so they have more time to put out that creative content. <clears throat> okay? If you're crazy, and you are, you're in great company because a lot of the people that we know and revere as fantastic leaders were crazy too. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. tried to commit suicide as a youth, and so did, uh, so did Mohandas Gandhi. Abraham, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's struggles with depression are well, well documented. And I believe that it is his, that it is his soul and his having been through so much that made him such a fantastic leader when our country was being ripped apart. My advice to you, fly the crazy flag. Own it. Embrace it. Stop trying to pass for normal. And understand the little quirks and the little idiosyncrasies that make you you. And understand how they, uh, how they could be a liability in your life, but also how they could be deeply and profoundly beneficial as you go about your life. The next thing I want to point out to you is that a lot of what you believe is wrong. The reason that a lot of what you believe is wrong has already been touched on today. We as people, our brains have an interest in keeping, keeping a self-image of knowledge, competence, and just generally knowing what's going on, right? As part of this, we engage in something that's called the confirmation bias, which is once we've made a decision or sort of set our worldview up, we then surround ourselves with people and take in film and literature and other sorts of in information that supports our ideas, right? Because we want to feel like we're getting it right. We don't want to have our ideas challenged. We don't want to do what Lisa was talking about earlier and revisit these sacred cows um, that we've so long believed in. But as a result, we get insulated from the truth sometimes. I want to talk about a famous study called the free choice paradigm here. The free choice paradigm says people pick from six Monet, six impressionist pieces of artwork, right? 
And when they choose them, they rank them from their most preferred to their least preferred, one through six. A psychologist then comes up and says, um, you can take one of these home, um, but we're out of number one, we're out of number two, and we're out of five and six. So you can take home number three or number four. Okay? They take home three, typically, because that's the one they voted was most preferred. And two weeks later, the psychologist asks them to come back and ask them which one is their most preferred now. What has happened in almost every instance is the number three has now moved to the second slot, and the number four painting that was not chosen has learned, uh, moved to the next to last slot. Because we have spent, we as people, take the choices that we make and build those choices up, and the choices that we do not choose, uh, we begin to denigrate and cut down and tell ourselves all the reasons why we were a genius for not making that dumb choice. The problem with this as a life philosophy is that hate feeds on this sort of insulation from different ideas. When we look at bigoted groups, when we look at hate crimes and these sorts of things, we almost always see that these groups have been insulated from the very people they profess to hate. It's easy to hate an idea, it's easy to hate a creed, uh, but it's very hard to hate a person with whom you break bread and speak to every day. I want you to look. How many of you came with a loved one? I want you to turn to your loved one, uh, be that your sister, brother, mother, wife, whatever. Turn to that loved one, give them a hug, tell them you love them, say thank you for coming to TEDx for me, okay? <laughs> hug, hug it out, guys. Hug it out. And I want you now to know that the person you just hugged, <laughs> the person you just hugged is more likely to kill you than any boogeyman is, okay? In fact, your appendix is more likely to kill you than Al-Qaeda, right? This is because we think we're safe and we're not, right? I lived in Hawaii with my beautiful wife, Katrina, who's here, um, just a few months after we got married. The first day we were in Hawaii, I flipped on our little sad 12-inch TV, and what was on? Shark Week. And the show that was on was the 10 most dangerous spots to get attacked by a shark, and Hawaii had three of the top 10. Guess who didn't get in the water for four months in Hawaii, right? I later learned that the odds of a shark attack are one in 300 million, whereas the odds of doing something I did every day in Hawaii, taking a bath, um, the, the odds of dying in the bathtub are one in 2,200. The odds of getting eaten by a shark are one in 300 million. As a people, we worry about all the wrong stuff, right? All the stuff that's gonna kill you is boring crap you do every day right? Driving to work, eating a hamburger, taking a bath, right? This illusion of safety keeps us from engaging with life, okay? A, a Tedster in, in a talk that I saw said something that I thought was fantastic. If you see it on the news, it is of necessity rare enough that you don't need to worry about it, okay? <laughs> If you are seeing something on the news, if these scare tactics of the media are keeping you from engaging in life and doing what would make your life more rich and fulfilling, get over it, move on, risk, because the stuff that's going to kill you is boring and decidedly unsexy. Okay? The next thing that I want to talk about is that your ideas aren't that great, right? <clears throat> None of you have ideas worth sharing, incidentally. <clears throat> and this is why. Because we think of new ideas in terms of old ideas. The experiences that we've had and the things that we've learned serve as the lens by which we explain all new things, okay? Think about a couple examples. We ask people to describe God. What do they describe? Their dad, right? We ask people to, we ask people to describe alien spacecraft. What do they tell us it's like? Kind of like the thing you put your tea on, except it's flying, right? A flying saucer. We don't have original ideas. Ideas happen when, new ideas happen when, new, when old ideas hook up and collide. And I want to tell you about an idea that I had recently that didn't change the world, but I thought it was pretty cool. Um, to set the stage for you a little bit, the old ideas that were happening, um, I was helping my two-year-old get ready for Halloween. Um, I was thinking a lot about the power of storytelling and the power of games. I had recently given a, a presentation in Las Vegas about the psychology of gamification. Um, mix that up with all the regular doctor psychology junk that's rattling around in there. Um, and I came out with this. Uh, zombie corporate training, right? <laughs> whereby, 
whereby I invented a zombie narrative uh, for one of my clients, Clearlink, based in Salt Lake. And I created an elaborate zombie narrative that said zombies have taken over Salt Lake, um, and this is what's happening. You've got to form teams. We taught them lessons, and then uh, if they didn't uh, implement the lessons to my satisfaction, they were turned into zombies, right? Not the greatest idea of all time, but a lot of people learned a lot of stuff, okay? This is why we don't have creative ideas. 27% of Americans graduate from college with a bachelor's degree, very low. 42% of that 27% never read another book, okay? Let that sink in, right? 42% never read another book. 80% of American households in a given year do not purchase or read a book as a household, okay? And 9 million viewers tuned in for each episode of The Jersey Shore, okay? <laughs> Your ideas are as good or as stupid as the things that you are putting in your head, right? We've heard about this from our, our, our media guru. You put stupid stuff in and stupid stuff comes out. The next thing I want to talk about is that you're chasing the wrong dream. If I did a survey, I bet every single person in here would tell me that they wanted to make more money at their job. 20% of Americans think they're on the cusp of becoming, becoming a millionaire, but only 2% actually are, okay? The size of the average American household has tripled in the last 65 years. And what has that done to the gross national happiness that we talked about? Meh, nothing, right? It's flatlined over that same period of time, okay? A recent Princeton study shows us that after $75,000, happiness has not increased one iota because $75,000 for a household is what it takes to meet the necessities of life, and after that, it's all on you and your internal experience, okay? Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor and my hero as a psychologist or a psychiatrist said this, ever more people today have the means to live but no meaning to live for. <clears throat> and the final hard truth is that the time will never be right. That dumb idea that I made fun of earlier, your wish to start a business or start a family or do whatever it is you want to do, the time is never going to be right for that. And this is the reason why. The reason why is because humans are two times as upset about a loss as they are happy about a gain. So what do we do to insulate ourselves from the possibility of a loss? We create elaborate narratives about the economy's bad or I don't have enough experience or these sorts of things. And these excuses that, we, the excuses that we construct for ourselves end up becoming the shackles that keep us from pursuing our dreams. Here's just a quick overview of the companies that were formed in a recession or a depression, just a few of the hundreds of successful companies. So right now, you've been educated. You've been educated about some things that you do that stand in the way of you being successful. And having been thusly educated, you are standing at a crossroads. And the crossroads is this. You choose today, right here in this room, whether you want your life to be not bad or whether you want your life to be great. Whether you want your life to be devoid of risk or full of meaning. And it's my sincere hope that you will choose a life of meaning. Thank you.